Uh, the rest of you, please grab your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 5, because uh, we're going to have a really, really fun, great time this morning. There's no snow cones up here, but we're going to have a really, really fun, great time. I figure if I say it enough, you'll believe that and it'll just happen, right? Acts chapter 5, you guys, here's what we're going to do this morning is this. So we read a big chunk of scripture last week. We're continuing on, um, kind of in this six-part or six-point series, all coming from those 20-some verses we read last week. It's Acts chapter 5. It starts in verse 22 and goes to the end of the chapter. And, and what I want to encourage you to do is this week read all of that. This morning what I want to do is I'm just going to touch on a few verses as we get into our first point of this series. And if you remember, what we are going to be talking about are these six things. We're going to be learning from the early church and we're going to learn how, how were they faithful through the flogging. And that's today's topic. Then we're going to look at how they were brothers in the battle. They, they were together as they went through these hard times. They stayed passionate even after their imprisonment. They were fearless in the fire. We're going to learn about grappling with God. How so many of us, we, we fight with God. How can you fight with God? And we're going to learn about being open to opposition. Kind of visiting this idea of being able to disagree with one another and still be friends and still kind of go on with life. This art that we've lost in our country. So those are the six points. This morning, we're just going to touch on this first one. Being faithful through the flogging. And I want you to look at Acts chapter 5. We're going to look at verse 17. We're just going to read a few of these verses to kind of bring back to our memories a little bit of what they were enduring it during this particular time. Acts 5, 17, it says this, Then the high priest rose up, and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation, and they laid their hands on the apostles, and they put them in the common prison. They were physically taken and put in prison. Jump down to verse 33. Verse 33, it says, and when they heard this, they were furious and they plotted to kill them. When they heard that the, the apostles, after they were released, they were back out preaching in the temple. It made these religious people furious. So now we have these guys, they get thrown in jail, the angel sets them free. Um, and, and now they, they want to be the religious people. They want to kill the apostles. This is all what they're going through during this time. And if you jump down to verse 40, uh, this I just can't get away from these, these verses right here. Verses 40 to 42, it says this, And they agreed with him. They, they're agreeing with Gamaliel. You'll read that this week. And when they had called for the apostles and had beaten them. I want you to see that. I want to say that over and over again. They beat them. I want you to have the picture in your mind. They are whipped. They're being flogged. They have whips. They're being beaten. This isn't a fairy tale. This is real life history. And they feel every one of these things. If, if Brian was to walk up here and punch me, I would feel that. In exactly the same way these guys were feeling this pain. There was blood. I can't imagine actually the amount of blood that's taken place. You see, this is what the apostles are enduring because of their faith. This is what they're going through. They agreed with him, and when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, I'm in verse 40, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. Now, now verse 41 and 42, I just think we should all have this highlighted, how they respond. So they departed from the presence of the council, having been imprisoned and released and brought back to jail again, having been whipped and beaten, all of these things happened, their lives threatened, and they left rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Isn't that unbelievable? I mean, you want to talk about something impressive? And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Here's what it is. They remained faithful even through the flogging. There was nothing in their lives, kind of like this young couple right here. There was nothing that was more important than doing the will of God. And I want to share something with you guys. I believe the Holy Spirit is real. I believe He speaks to us. I believe He leads us. He guides us. I believe that He uses us. I believe the Spirit of God, His Holy Spirit, lives inside of us as believers. I believe that. And I believe that He works things together 
to get his message across. These guys coming today, I want, I want you to know something. These guys had no idea what I was going to be preaching about. I had no idea what they were going to come. My only prayer was that they come, that they talk about Thailand, and they do it well. That's my only prayer. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't really care what they talk about, just to do that. And now I want you to see this, if it doesn't already stick out to you. What they've talked about, one of the first things Marty told me in the lobby out there, was how this isn't easy. Like everybody goes to them and is like, oh, how cool is that? You get to go to Thailand. And the reality is, yeah, it's great. Our family is here. Our kids are here. Our grandkids are here. The language we know is here. The culture we know is here. We've built this great life together, but God is asking us to do something different. You see, serving God, they're being, in my, in my opinion, they're being faithful through the flogging. They're being faithful through the struggles, through the difficulties, through this, even the sacrifice and the suffering of what it is to serve God and to put Him above all else. Being faithful through the struggles, through the flogging. Now here's what I want to put out there today is this. For some of us, the flogging looks different. For some of us, the struggle that we are enduring where we have to really remain faithful through that is something that maybe we would call cancer. You get a diagnosis, and I immediately think of Barb and Dennis. Dennis gets a diagnosis of cancer. The surgery doesn't go as planned. And instead of getting mad and shaking his fist at God and running the other direction, Dennis says, I need God more now than ever. Yeah. And he gets closer to him. To me, that's one definition of being faithful through the flogging. God remains God even in the difficult times. For some, it's a financial struggle with the markets and, and just the economy being what it is. So many have lost so much in retirement funds, maybe a lost job. And, and even in that type of a situation, through a difficulty in life, it's remaining faithful to God, saying, God, I'm going to come closer to you. I'm still going to put you first, even in these difficulties in life. And you guys know the list can go on and on and on of what we would consider in our culture to be the flogging, to remain faithful. Whether it's because of our faith and the persecution that I believe someday is going to come, or if it's remaining faithful when life gets hard. But it's walking with God. It's remaining faithful in that flogging. And to me, you guys, if you're anything like me, I immediately go to this idea of, of so how do we do this? How do we remain faithful in the hard times of life? Whether, again, it's religious persecution or, or if it's struggle, something with our children, something with our parents, something with a sibling, something in life that's beyond our control. How do we remain faithful with these things? And today what I want to do is this, is I want to give you, I want to give you what's called anchor points. You see, I, I like archery. I, I by no means am I a, a master or, or anything like that, but this is what I enjoy. I enjoy hunting with the bow. I enjoy shooting the bow. It's just one of those things that, that I, I really have, have come to really love. And in order to be successful, what you have to have, number one, is you have to have consistency. And the consistency that you have to have is something called anchor points. When I draw my bow back, the string touches my nose, the corner of my mouth, and my hand is placed at the same place on my jaw every time. Those are my anchor points. So when I draw back, when I'm practicing and I, sh I shoot with a trigger, when I, when I draw back, my hand is always in the same place on my jaw. I can feel that string on my nose. I can feel it in the corner of my, of my mouth. Matter of fact, I know it's there because every time I shoot, I lose more beard hairs. Just go, whoosh, yanks them right up. But here's the important thing. These anchor points... These anchor points, if I, when I'm practicing my bow at home, when I'm at mom and dad's, and I'm practicing, mom and dad sat over here yesterday, now you throw me up. <laughs> when I'm at mom and dad's, Al and Sherry are over here going, no way, man, we don't want them. <laughs> but when I'm at mom and dad's and I'm practicing the bow, even though I'm not actually hunting, it's in those moments when I'm practicing when these anchor points are so important because that's when they're just going to be natural. I feel that. I feel that same spot. 
And as long as I'm practicing and I'm getting so familiar with those anchor points, what happens is, is then when I'm hunting and there's a deer in front of me or a turkey or someday hopefully an elk, what happens is this, is I'm automatically able to handle that pressure because I do what I've done every single day when I shoot. I go right to my anchor points. I go right to that spot where I know it's consistent. And today, church, to me, the answer, how do we, how do we remain faithful in the flogging? We need anchor points. We need to have these things that we do in life when life is good, when life is easy. Because I think on the easy days, honestly, I think on the easy days, what we're doing is preparing for the hard days. <laughs> because I'm old enough now, being in my early 30s, I'm old enough to know that it's not a matter of if the hard times are going to come, but when they come. The unexpected. And what are your anchor points? And this morning, I think we can learn very clearly four anchor points. Four, four things that we can... We can turn to, and, and again, I'm, I'm all about learning from the early church. I'm all about learning from what they did. Because we're here, so clearly it worked. Amazing things happened, clearly it was effective. And so if you go back to your Bibles and you look at Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Here's where I want to get our four real quick anchor points. And, and I hope today... I look out, and many of you I know, it's like, here's my encouragement. Continue with these things. It's like an, it's somebody who shoots their bow. You don't go shoot once, hit the bullseye once, and say, okay, I'm ready to hunt. You put a deer in front of you, you have no idea what you're going to do. What you do is you daily go out, and you find those anchor points, so that when the pressure's on, you know exactly what you're going to go to. So today, maybe these anchor points, they're just a reminder to you, hey, keep doing these things. For some of you, Maybe you're finding you don't have any of these anchor points in your life. And I want you to understand something. I want to say this, it's okay. Don't feel guilt and shame or feel bad. Just, just learn from this and be like, yeah, you know what? I, I, I want to have these things in my life. I want these as my anchor points in life. And so the first thing, the first anchor point today that I want to encourage you with, again, this comes right from Acts chapter 2, verse 42. My, my New King James, it says this, and they continued, they being this early church, this body of believers, it says, and they continued steadfastly. Many of your Bibles say, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That's point one. That's anchor point one today, the apostles' teaching. Now listen, the early church, they had the apostles, right? I mean, imagine that. You're going to sit down and you're going to listen to the apostles teach you. But here's the deal, you guys. We have the apostles teaching, don't we? Yes. We have it right here. And that's, that's anchor point number one. It's to ask you this question. Do you believe in the word of God? Like, do you believe when, when the Bible says God's going to do something, do you believe he's going to do it? Do you believe when the Bible says that God has done something? For example, sent his son to die to take your place. Do you believe that he's done that? Do you believe when the Bible says that you are filled with the Spirit of God as a believer, that you can walk with boldness knowing that God himself lives inside of you? Do you believe that? You see, because the more we fill ourselves with the truth of the Word of God, the more prepared we are to remain faithful through the flogging. Because how many of you know that when life gets hard, it seems like we're inundated with lies? You're not worthy. You're not good enough. God doesn't love you. I mean, these are all the lies that we start to hear. And what happens? It beats us down. But what's the word of God say? What is the apostles teaching? What, what is this? This says God loves you. This says God is with you no matter where you are. This says, this says that he has filled you with his spirit. That he gives you that strength and peace to walk through whatever it is. Knowing, trusting in the word of God. That's the first anchor point. Spending time with the word of God. The second anchor point is this. Again, it comes from Acts chapter 2, 42. So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The second thing they devoted themselves to is this, is to the breaking of bread. And now here's, here's what's so beautiful about this. I got to watch people break bed, bread this last week. 
I got to watch so many of you eat. And I got to tell you, some of you, you got to bring a bib when you go to a restaurant, man. It's crazy. I'm not going to look at anybody in particular, but you might want to consider it. But here's the, here's the reality is this. Breaking bread is the things I've studied. It's, it's simply this. It's eating meals together. Why? Because something beautiful happens when we pause and we break bread together. When we pause and we eat. And, and I want to show you guys a little bit of, of what this last week looked like. And, and I want you to hear something. The value of breaking bread together. Now, now the 60 plus group, we went on a train ride and then we went to a restaurant and we ate. And, and I got to tell you, it was such a cool thing to sit in that room and listen to all of the visiting. Man, I'm not kidding. It was beautiful. And that's what, that's what we need to be committed to. Because it does something to us. When we reach those tough times, the breaking of bread, the building of these relationships, helps us to remain faithful through the difficulties, through the flogging. Let's watch that, that 60 plus video, if we could please, you guys. All of that chapter. Children of all ages. Thank you, Kelly. Isn't that neat, though? And I know that some of you, you're looking at it, it's like, what's the big deal? I'll tell you what the big deal is, is that there's people who went there, who met new people, and walked away. The train, that was cool. This changed lives. This breaking of bread together in the conversation that took place around that, it's unbelievable. Throw those other pictures up there, Callie. Friday night then, we had a group of 50 plus guys in this room eating meals. And again, there were all of these different people sitting together, getting to know each other. So that's half the room right there. And then if you flip to that next picture, this is the other half of the room. And here's what's happening here. All of these guys... And you guys know this, guys don't like to talk to each other. I, it's amazing. Like you can spend the day hunting or fishing together and have like five, five minutes of conversation and you get home and, and, and your wife will say, what'd you talk about? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, <laughs> we hunted. I don't know. You know what? I don't know. But the, in this room, it was, like, it was like I was standing here trying to get everybody's attention and there was such a, a, a rumble of guys talking. You guys, this is the value. So again, the anchor points. It's breaking bread together. It's taking time to break bread together. Being devoted to it. Because when we do that, there's relationships. I've eaten meals with some of you and seen you just get emotional. Talking about your life. None of those conversations would have taken place here in church. But over a meal, something beautiful happens. That's the second anchor point today, to break bread together. The third thing that they devoted themselves to is the fellowship. Not simply to fellowship, because that's kind of the breaking of bread. But they were devoted to the fellowship. And this is where, to me, there's, a, there's something different. It means they were devoted to being there for one another. And we read that about the early church. And they had everything in common. And when somebody had need, they stepped up and they did that. They helped each other out. And again, when life gets hard, uh, I, there's a gentleman here today, called me yesterday and, and just wanted to chat and me to pray with him. Why? Because life was hard and he was feeling alone and isolated. Yeah, that's what happens, isn't it? You start to feel just kind of stuck. Guess what? We need to be committed to one another. You want to get through hard times? You want to be faithful through the fellowship to continue to walk out and live out your faith and, and being obedient and serving God? We need one another to come alongside and to hold each other up, don't we? And, and this video, here's the deal. This, this is a video from Wednesday night when we were out at the Fellings house. And over 50 of us were there and we worked. And I'm going to tell you this. When um, Leo's son Tyler made this video for us, 
And, and I've watched it, I don't know how many times now, and every single time, it just gets me. And when we get to the end, Callie, I want you to leave that picture up there because I want you guys to see that. Let's watch this video. Look at that. And we're going to leave that up there because if you don't know what's going on in this picture, we were able to stretch all the way around their house, making a circle, holding hands, and we prayed. And I love, it's the perfect shape of that circle of the logo of our church. Committed to the fellowship. You see, there's something powerful that happens. I look out, you got tears in your eyes, some of you. So many of you came up to me that night, tears in your eyes, saying, this is what it's all about. This is the church. It is. It's being committed to the fellowship. To be faithful through the difficult times, it's stuff like this. Listen, what this did for Barb and Dennis, I can only imagine. But what it did for those of you that were there, what it did for me, I, I would guess it, it superseded what it did for Barb and Dennis. Why? Because it's what we want. It's what we need. It's what's inside of us. Church, we want to remain faithful to God, whatever comes our way. And one of the ways we do that, one of our anchor points, is to be committed to the fellowship. And listen, I, I want to challenge some of you a little bit right now. If the extent of your relationship with the fellowship is coming to church on Sunday morning, I just want to say this. You're missing it. This is a time for us to gather. Absolutely. But getting together a bunch of guys, getting together a bunch of old, uh, the 60 plus people, <laughs> getting together and working, one of the most beautiful things Wednesday night Seeing a family there together. I mean, it's just, I, I can go on and on about this stuff. It's what we need. Being devoted to, being committed to the fellowship. And the fourth anchor point today is this. They were devoted to prayer. I love what, what Marty said when he, when he asked for our prayers for them as missionaries. And how he talked about when we pray it, it just kind of melts the mountain or melts these things off the mountain. And, and I love the image of that. To be praying, not, not just to be praying before dinner, but, but to be praying. To spend time praying and to gather. Because understand this, when, when the early church, when one was in prison, the rest gathered to pray. When one suffered, they suffered together. When they rejoiced, they rejoiced together. There was, these guys are Jewish people. Don't, don't get in your mind that because they believed Jesus was the Messiah, they stopped being Jewish people. They were still Jewish people. They still, we know from the book of Acts, they went up to the temple for their times of prayer. They still did these things. Listen, they were committed to these things. I want to challenge us as a church to be committed 
to these things. If we want to be faithful through the difficult times, and again, whether it's religious persecution or hard times that we come upon, having it be one of our natural anchor points to just pray, you want to know how much that's going to build you up? When you go to God instead of reaching for something else or someone else, God is faithful and God is unchanging. Every Monday night from 6 to 7 right here, one night a week, there's an opportunity for you to come together with one focus, to simply pray. That's it. And, and, and it's like, well, I don't, I don't want to go because then I got to commit to every Monday. No, you don't. We're not here every Monday. If you can make it, if you find yourself able to make it on a Monday night, what I think would happen is you'd come and you'd appreciate the atmosphere, the informal atmosphere that there is. Yet everybody coming together praying. You can pray in a group. There's times where I, I love praying with everybody else. There's other, there's other times where it's like, I got too much on my mind. Things are stressing me out, burdens, whatever it is. I'll go off by myself. I'll just kneel on a chair and I will pray. There's even times where I've covered my ears because I don't want to be distracted. I just need time with the Lord. And it's a beautiful time for that to happen. But you guys, if we want to, and I know we want to, remain faithful through the flogging, we have to consider these. What are our anchor points. What do we go to naturally every time so that when the pressure is on, we can be faithful? Today, I want to ask you to consider those. And what does your life look like in these areas? Amen?